Good morning or afternoon or evening. Welcome to the Scripture Habit. Welcome to this space, this resource, uh, community, I mean, whatever we can be for you. Our goal is to help you develop that habit of getting into Scripture every day. It's a life-transforming habit. It really is. So we show up because we know sometimes Scripture can be intimidating. Um, so we talk through it together. My name is Rebecca Palmatier. I'm a pastor. I get to be a host here at The Scripture Habit, and I say welcome. And I'm coming a little bit later today. There's veteran celebrations that are happening at my daughter's school, so we had to do that this morning. But excited to be here now to look, hopefully we're going to get through the rest of chapter 5 of the Gospel of John. So <clears throat> we're going to uh, wait just a second. Hi, Bonnie. Good morning. Brenda, good morning, guys. Sorry, I'm coming on late this morning. We had all of the, the veterans things. And of course, um, my my husband would prefer not to be in public in his uniform unless he absolutely has to. But my daughters were like so into it. Like they're like, please, dad, please. And they want to wear all the things. And so it was really cute. And I just kept looking at my husband like, oh, look what you do. For our girls, I know you are you don't want to do it. Anyway, good morning, Darlene. All right, guys, let's pray. And then we're going to get into scripture. Let's do it. Oh, good morning, God. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit that is in us. Your Holy Spirit is with us. He leads us. He guides us. He comforts. Thank you. Let our hearts be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Help us receive. In your name, amen. I just sensed that this morning. I don't know if that's for someone. Um, just to be able to sit in the presence of God, right? Without agenda, without um, something. Just to be able to sit and just... <sighs> Yeah, I feel that this morning. Anyway, let's go ahead. Let's dig in. Um, yeah, Darlene and, and Bonnie, thank you very much. Okay, we're in the Gospel of John. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry about that. We are in chapter 5, and we've actually been in this chapter for a while because we're taking it like a section at a time. So just to recap, in verses 17 through 29, we saw Jesus respond Earlier in the chapter, the very beginning of the chapter, we saw Jesus heal a man uh, by a pool in Bethsaida or Bethesda. And the complaint that the religious leaders gave, the first thing was, oh, wait a minute, you can't be doing any work on the Sabbath. And, and not only did Jesus heal someone on the Sabbath, which they may or may not have been okay with, we don't, we don't know, but they definitely went to the man and was like, you can't pick up your mat because that was considered work. And the guy was like, well, the guy that healed me told me to pick up my mat and walk, right? <clears throat> Created this tension between Jesus <clears throat> and the religious leaders. Not a new tension. We've been seeing it come up for a while. Um, but this is Jesus's response to them now because they, they have these questions. Oh, you know what? I'm going to skip past the framework. If this was um, how Jesus laid out his identity, uh, how he explained the relationship between the Father and the Son. Uh, I'm going to click through those. I would say look at our last video to see the description. This right here. This is really the, the questions or concerns that the uh, Jewish leaders have. And, and I would say this makes sense. It makes sense that they would have these questions. All right? So the first one was, who has the right? Like... And, and when I put right, I'm thinking like this spiritually legal kind of claim, enforceable claim, to do any work on the Sabbath. Who would have the right to do that? Why? Because their uh, tradition, their, their words of taking the uh, rest on the Sabbath, which was the command that God gave, you're not to work, I want you to rest, just like God did, um, took the seventh day to rest and remember him, right? they added all sorts of guidelines to make sure that they didn't break that rule. And so now that's kind of accepted, uh, same measure as the law, really. And so in their eyes, well, wait a minute, who, 
who has a right that could tell anyone that they could do work on the Sabbath when our tradition tells us that, that God would be dishonored if we did it, right? First claim. Second thing, who has the authority to heal on the Sabbath? <clears throat> that authority is like this religious, or not religious, um, responsibility and um, the power, right, to heal, much less on the Sabbath. And then this last question. So this was the second half of Jesus's interaction with the man that he healed as he told him his sins were forgiven, right? Who has the jurisdiction to forgive or pardon sins? When I, when I say jurisdiction, these are all kind of like legal terms, aren't they? Right, authority, jurisdiction. <clears throat> but in their eyes, that is how we are supposed to navigate God's law, right? So jurisdiction is this legal authority. Who has this like purview? Who can make legal decisions or judgments? Especially when it comes to forgiving or pardoning sin. Even the religious leaders themselves couldn't do that, right? They, they went to the temple. They were part of the process, right? And so these questions that they have about Jesus, I, I say completely valid, right? I understand why they'd ask these. It's a big change from their view. But for a second, I put, put a couple of responses to those. All right, so who has the right to do any work on the Sabbath? God does. God does. Hi, Flo. I am praying for you, friend. You've been on my mind. I'm praying for you. Who has the right to do any work on the Sabbath? God does. Yeah. Who has the authority to heal on the Sabbath? We'd say the Son of God. God, the Son of God, right? Together. Um, I mean, Sabbath was created by them and for them, right? And then this idea, well, well, who is the only one that can forgive or pardon sins? Well, that would be God. That would be the, the righteous judge, which is a name that we call Jesus. Do you remember how when Jesus was talking about the son and the father and the relationship with them and how he said that the father has um, passed on <clears throat> the... Um, responsibility and authority for judgment. These are all kind of big things, right? And and I don't mean to like, I don't know, um, tunnel, what do they call that when you kind of go off? It isn't a tangent, but like to go deep down the hole on these things. But I wanna point out, just so that you and I could feel together and recognize why they would, why they would be asking these questions, why they would feel such a confusion or uncertainty because this is pushing the things that they believe that they've come to embrace and know their perspective of God and his word. It's being challenged. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. There we go. Starting in verse 30, Jesus says this, I can do nothing on my own. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Jesus says here, his only job, his only focus is as the son of God, means the representative right there in the flesh of God, but it's not him coming to do his own will. Jesus didn't come and be like, okay, everybody praise me. I'm going to take the role of of this king and everyone will bow down, which, I mean, you'd think the son of God could have that right, right? But Jesus didn't do that. He's like, listen, I'm about my father's business. I will only do what he tells me to do, right? <clears throat> I loved this quote. The son who defers in all things to the father is not likely to act independently of him, in supremely critical issues of authority. When the son continues to submit, and, and picture just a father-son relationship, perhaps the son is, is learning the father's business, right? In, in our sense and understanding. <coughs> Rather than a son just trying to force his own way, Jesus is clearly continuing to say, 
I am only about the work of my father. And that's comforting. Here we go. In the last section of chapter five, um, we're going to go through it a little, I don't want to say quick, but I want us to get through it today. Jesus brings up four witnesses that are testimonies to who he is. And it's going to have this imagery of a legal trial to it. Okay. <clears throat> he is speaking in response. And, and I want you to remember, why would Jesus perhaps use this imagery of uh, legal right, standing, claim, jurisdiction. Why? Well, because those are kind of the questions that they're after answers for, right? They want, they want answers, really. What on earth gives this guy the right? How can he do these things? So Jesus responds, four witnesses. We're going to count them out together and we're going to talk through what Jesus is saying. You ready? Okay. Verse 31. He says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Now, you and I say, um, <coughs> Jesus, what do you say? He is, <coughs> excuse me, he is, is using an example. <coughs> so sorry, let me get a drink. <coughs> Jesus is using an example. He's saying, listen, anyone can testify about themselves, right? And do you believe it just because they say it about themselves? No, right? Uh, if we're thinking of witnesses, someone gets on the stand, right, to defend themselves. Do you think that people take their word as heavily as they do evidence or witnesses? No, right? And so Jesus is pointing this out. He's like, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to testify about myself. You guys wouldn't believe it anyway. So he points to verse 32. There's another who testifies about me. And I know that the testimony he gives about me is true. I explain this. Anyone can say anything about themselves, but when others act as a witness and give testimony in a court, when they bring evidence, there's credibility. So Jesus now is bringing up four witnesses. Very first one, verse 33. You sent messengers to John and he testified the truth. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the first one, all right? I love how, um, how he describes it, especially verse 35. So Jesus in verse 34 says, I don't receive human testimony, but I say these things so that you may be saved. When he's, that phrasing, I don't receive human testimony, what he's saying is I don't depend on it. Like, listen, this isn't for me. <laughs> this is for you. So you can see these four witnesses. I'm sharing them with you so you see. I don't depend on it, right? Okay, he says in verse 35, John was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But I have a greater testimony than John's because of the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. That's witness number two. So the first thing he pointed out was John the Baptist, and he's like, listen, you guys liked him for a while. <laughs> you liked him and respected him for a while until, until he spoke about me and then you started to reject him, right? But he's like, he's a, he's a witness. Witness number two, the work that I'm doing. He's, Jesus says there, the works that God has given me to accomplish, these very works I am doing testify about me that the Father has sent me. Okay. If you were in the crowd and you were watching Jesus perform miracles and you were listening to his teaching and you were marveling, right? Those things speak to you. Your, your own account speaks to you, right? And he's saying, listen, the works that I did, I just healed a man. Is that not a testimony to you? Is that not like a witness giving an account? The works that I'm doing, those are a testimony. That's number two. Hi, Joanna, good morning. Verse 37, he continues, and Jesus says, the father who sent me has himself testified about me. So that's witness number three. The father, God himself. Now, um, 
there's a, there's a few thoughts about this one because um, some point to uh, thinking back when God spoke from the heavens, right? When Jesus was baptized saying, this is my son and him I am well pleased, right? That could be the testimony that Jesus was referring to. Uh, but there is more to it. The uh, Faith Life Study Bible says the current generation of God's people knew God only through the tradition and teaching of their ancestors, not in their own experience. That speaks to the second half of this verse. So he says, God is, is a witness, right? God himself has spoken, has testified on my behalf. But then Jesus said, but you haven't heard his voice at any time and you haven't seen his form. So God has been speaking, but you're not recognizing that it's him. Can I pause for a minute? I feel like I need to pause on that. How many times in your life have you been working through something and in the moment you did not see or recognize what God was actually doing for you until you got through it and then you look back and then you can see God there, right? Sometimes our sight is so limited that we're, we're not looking for something because it's just not even on our radar. When he says that you haven't heard his voice at all, it's not because he isn't speaking. It's because that's off your radar. You, you haven't been paying attention. Their relationship with God was based off of their tradition. Verse 38, he continues, you don't have his word residing in you because you don't believe the one he sent. You don't have his word residing in you. <clears throat> the Bible speaks today says by implication, the unseen God has spoken and disclosed himself in the written scriptures. But it's one thing to know words on a page. It's another to have his word residing in you. Jesus is pushing this envelope, isn't he? You don't have his word residing in you. This is starting to create even more of a rub because their whole life and culture has been built around sacred scriptures, hasn't it? Jesus is going to get even more to the point when he's talking. Okay, let's keep going. Are you with me, guys? Are you with me? I know we're kind of going through a, a little bit faster. Verse 39, Jesus continues, and he's talking about, again, their relationship with scripture and yet their inability to see or hear God. His word, even though they pour over it, it's not in them. Yeah. Verse 39, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. But you are not willing to come to me so that you may have life. Witness number four. So we had John the Baptist. We had the works that Jesus did, the miracles that they could see with their own eyes, testifying about who he was. God himself. And then scripture, he's saying, you go, you look over scripture, you read it, you, you debate it philosophically all the time. You have dialogues and questions about implications of God's word. And yet you're missing, you're missing what God has been pointing to and leading us to in his word. You're missing it. He says, you're not willing to come to me to have life. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Can you tell we've had coughs in our house? I'm sorry. Okay, this is from, again, the Bible Speaks Today. Jesus concedes that the Jewish leaders diligently study the sacred writings. Yeah, you pour over the scriptures. But their study is unfruitful because the student is not looking for Christ in the scriptures. They haven't been looking for the Messiah in that sense. They've just been memorizing and trying to receive and debate and wrestle with the word that they have, but they missed it. Yep. 41, Jesus says, I do not accept glory from people. And that word accept, um, 
It's not saying that we can't give him glory, but he's saying his glory. Actually, it isn't like us just praising him. His glory consists of his loving fellowship with God. That's where his glory is. It's in his relationship with God. We don't actually validate him in that sense. God does. Communion with him. He says, but I know you, that you have no love for God within you. He says, I know you, but you don't have love for God in you. And I think that would be a slap in the face to any religious leader, don't you think? Can you imagine Jesus saying that, looking them straight in the eye and saying, you know, you've not come, you've not looked at the word, you've not seen what God has been speaking this entire time. You've been looking at it with a different lens and you've been missing this. But in your quest through scripture, you haven't actually developed a love for God. We're going to talk about this more. The posture that is is very common. And, and listen, before we just say that this is like a Jewish culture posture, I'm going to tell you no. Christians do this too, where we begin to look at God's word <clears throat> as rules and boxes to check off. And, and we kind of know the system, but we don't know the God, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, you don't actually know him. You memorized all of these things, but you don't really know him. You don't really love him. That's not in there for you. Mm. Verse 43, he says, I have come in my father's name, and yet you don't accept me. If someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. Faith Life Study Bible says that this alludes to Israel's tendency to accept false prophets who tell them what they want to hear. And, and we do see a history with God's people. We do see a history where the prophets that we treasure now and the prophets that they treasured then at the moment when the prophet was coming speaking the word, they did not receive it. <laughs> they didn't receive God's message. They instead embraced people that just told them, you know, you're doing fine and, and go do these things that you want anyway. And yeah, so Jesus says, I'm coming in my father's name. I'm not coming to you for glory. I'm not trying to um, get power or dominion or money or whatever that a lot of these other false prophets, their improper motivations are. Jesus says, I'm not coming for that reason but you reject me and then you turn around and you will accept them. Something's wrong with this picture. <clears throat> um, verse 44, how can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but you don't seek the glory that comes from God? The Bible Speaks Today says that their fundamental failure lay in esteeming human praise above God's praise. And this is, this is huge. Theirs was a religion of human merit. One which seeks salvation through obeying the commandments. Do you see that? And so when Jesus is talking about glory, you seek glory from one another. <clears throat> like, oh, you're doing a good job. Good job obeying all of the all of the traditions, all of the rules that, that we have set in our culture. Good job. You're doing good. They might not be, but you're doing good, right? And they're, they're looking to be validated from one another. But they've missed the heart of God. They're not actually being validated by God. Yeah? He says, uh, how can you believe since you accept the glory from one another and he says, but you don't seek the glory that comes from the only God. When we're, when we're thinking of glory, we're thinking of this um, evidence that we can see. I, I, when I, whenever I think of glory, I always think of the sun. And I think of like an eclipse where, because we can't look straight at the sun. <clears throat> we go blind. But in an eclipse kind of thing, I don't remember if 
solar lunar i don't you tell me which one it is but the sun gets blocked out but by the moon but then you see all of the rays that are still very vis- visible and you can very very clearly tell that that thing is there but you couldn't look at it straight you know Whenever I see glory mentioned with Jesus, I I think of that same thing. I think like here is Jesus, who is the glory of God. He's actually the, the, the glory that we can see. And they don't accept him. Do you feel like a repeating theme? Do you, do you feel it? They don't accept him. They don't accept him. They're looking at the wrong thing, right? Okay, this verse is killer. Verse 45, Jesus says, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom you have set your hope. Again, he's using all this legal jargon, right? When he's saying accuse you, he's he's talking about this legal accusation in court. All right? Signifying malicious accusation and secret. It was different in their culture than like public accusation. It, it, was, it was looked at different. And I just marvel at that a little bit because of the way that they responded to Jesus. They accused him kind of maliciously in secret and private. They didn't at first do it publicly. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Jesus says, I'm not here to accuse you because you're already being accused, having this legal accusation made against you. By Moses? And then he says, on whom you set your hope? What do you think he's saying there? Okay. I thought this was worth pointing out. This is more of a um, perspective on tradition passed down versus... Uh, what's in scripture. But it says, uh, the Bible speaks today says, there's some evidence that many Jews believe that Moses's intercession for the people of God was continued in the heavens. And hence that Moses was their uh, guarantor with God. That Moses, they align with Moses, they align with the law, right? And that Moses was interceding on their behalf. They think that. Why? Because, well, when Moses was here, wasn't he the one that was interceding for the people to God most often? Yeah. But again, so they might set their hope in Moses, but there's something that is actually switching this around. The one that they thought would be their guarantor, the one that would be their defender to God about how good and faithful they are at obeying the law, is actually accusing them. Why is Jesus saying that to them? When I see Moses mentioned, there's two connections that I I make in, in my head. The first one, Moses represents the law. The law was given to God's people through Moses, right? The Pentateuch. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Um, Which, not all of those are the law, but, but that captures what Moses brought to the people and the law, starting with the 10 commandments. And then the other instruction from God, God imparted it to Moses and said, write this down, write this down, Moses. Right. Moses also represents what we call the first covenant. Abraham and God had this relationship. I'll be your people. You know, I'll be your God. You'll be my people. Right? And from you, all the nations will, will be blessed. With Moses came this covenant that had conditions. Like, you need to obey the law. Obey my words. And that's how you show that you're my people. Right? And they kept breaking it. So, <clears throat> as we wrap up, I just want to point out this one scripture. Uh, let's read the last two verses and then I'll point it out. It's, it's Romans. For if you believed Moses... You would believe me because he wrote about me. That's interesting. But if you don't believe what he wrote, how will you believe my words? Again, we we could take time and look at Old Testament uh, symbolism and and um, like foreshadowing, you know, God using 
um, one seemingly specific thing, but he's conveying this bigger spiritual message for us. Things like blood as a payment for sin that was done in the temple, right? Jesus is actually saying, there's a lot in the scripture that points to me, that points to God and this plan for saving his people. But you haven't been paying attention to that. So how on earth now are you going to believe anything I, I have to say when your heart is so against it, you're not willing to, to look back and see what God was saying in his word? Okay, as we wrap up, I want to hit Romans 3, verses uh, 20 to 23. When we're talking about the law and being accused by the law versus um, how we are saved, this scripture comes to mind. For no one will be justified in his sight by the works of the law. In other words, you obeying all the Ten Commandments doesn't, doesn't actually save you. First of all, you can't perfectly keep it. So the minute you break one, you're a lawbreaker, right? But then the writer says here, because the knowledge of sin comes through the law. When we see the law, when we see rules like uh, commands like do not murder, do not lie, do not covet, those actually gave us this understanding of what sin is. And then we realize that we break it, right? Verse 21 says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. Meaning that it was there in, in the Old Testament. It was there. We don't have time to dig in it now. But it was there. God was speaking and foretelling it, right? <clears throat> that his salvation doesn't come through the law. The law helps you understand sin. Salvation is coming a different way. And verse 22 says, The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus to all who believe, since there is no distinction. Meaning it doesn't matter um, how Jewish you are or um, it doesn't matter your genealogy or your, um, I'm thinking like financial demographics, how much money you have or don't have. like Those things that society would use to distinct people into different categories. When it says, since there's no distinction, saying, listen, no matter where you come from, what you have or what you don't have, salvation, being able to be seen as righteous before God, despite the fact that you have sinned, that's a gift and it comes through belief in Jesus. Anyone, all who believe in Jesus will be saved. And then verse 23 says, for all have sinned and they fall short of the glory of God. This section was deep stuff. I know it was, and I know we've gone a couple minutes over. But I just want you to catch Jesus' response. What he's saying here is deep. <laughs> it, is, it is deep. It's like layer upon layer upon layer. And honestly, I don't think I did it justice. But I wanted us to catch, since they're asking who has authority, since they're questioning Jesus, like, what kind of authority do you have to heal someone or to forgive someone's sins or to tell someone that they can work on the Sabbath? Who are you, right? And so Jesus says, well, I'm the son of God, and this is our relationship. And then he talks about legal sense, witnesses, and testimonies that point to who he is. But he also lets them know at the same time, and yet I know your heart is still hard and you're not choosing to believe. You don't want to accept it. But it's here. It's here. Yeah. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. I pray that it would resonate in our heart today. Guide us in all truth, we ask. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the work that he did on our behalf, that we are not, we're not saved or made good enough for you because of all the churchy or goody things that we do. We're not, we're not made in, in right standing with you because we're a morally good person. Because even, even if we try to be good or moral, we still have sin. So we thank you for Jesus. Apart from him, we are accused and condemned. But through him, we can be made righteous and right standing with you. 
Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, have a great day. I will see you tomorrow. We're going to start jumping into uh, John chapter six. See you later. Bye.